Welcome to the Full Moon Film Buff, episode 58. We're going to talk about Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet the Wolfman from 2000. I watched this on DVD. I had seen this before. Watching this was a birthday request from one of my kids. Let's start with the prominent crew and cast. The film was directed by Kathy Castillo, written by John Lloyd. Two of the four films Kathy Castillo directed were the two Universal Chipmunk collaborations. She had a much more extensive career as an animator, doing a lot of work on the Chipmunks and Scooby-Doo franchises. Two great movies I loved that she worked on were Heavy Metal and Fire and Ice. John Loy has written over 50 animated TV shows and movies. He's currently working on Thomas and Friends All Engines Go, which dropped a new season the same month I watched Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet the Wolfman, so he's still working in the industry. The cast includes Ross Bagdasarian Jr. as Alvin Seville, Simon Seville, and David Seville, billed as Ross Bagdasarian. Janice Carmen voices Theodore, Brittany, Jeanette, and Eleanor. Maurice LaMarche voices Mr. Lawrence Talbot. Miriam Flynn voiced Principal Milligan. Rob Paulson voiced Mr. Rochelle. April Winchell voiced Madame Rhea. Elizabeth Daly voiced Nathan, billed as E.G. Daly. Frank Welker provided werewolf vocal effects. This is a superstar cast. Ross Bagdasarian Jr. is an actor, musician, and businessman. He and Janice Carmen are married. The pair are best known for continuing the legacy of the iconic animated singing group, The Chipmunks. As the son of Ross Bagdasarian Sr., the creator of Alvin and the Chipmunks, Ross inherited the responsibility of overseeing this beloved franchise. He only took over voicing The Chipmunks and other characters after his father's passing in 1972. Beyond preserving the popularity of the group, Ross expanded its influence in the diverse entertainment realm, including television shows, film, and merchandise. He has exactly one non-chipmunk-related voice credit I could find in the Lego Pirates of the Caribbean video game. Before her 1980 marriage to Ross Bagdasarian Jr., Janice was an actor. She voices key characters like Theodore and all three Chipettes, and has also produced and written for various chipmunks-related projects, ranging from television shows to feature films. You might want to sit down for this next bit. Maurice LaMarche is a voice actor and comedian renowned for his exceptional vocal talents. With a career spanning decades, Maurice has lent his distinctive voice to 419 animated characters, or he has credits. Some of those are multiple characters and counting. He's got multiple Emmys. The most well-known shows he's worked on are probably Futurama, Pinky and the Brain, As the Brain, among a host of other voices, and The Simpsons. Now, if you thought Maurice has a long list of credits, let me introduce you to Rob Paulson. Rob is a voice actor, singer, and podcaster renowned for his contributions to the animation industry. With a career also spanning several decades, Rob is one of the most respected and versatile voice actors working today. He has 559 credits and is adding more every year. He's recognized for lending his voice to iconic characters in numerous animated series, including Raphael in the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Yako Warner in the Animaniacs, and Pinky in Pinky and the Brain. He's also got an Emmy Award. Which brings us to Frank Welker and his 888 credits. With a career also covering decades, Welker is one of the most iconic and sought after voice talents in the industry. His remarkable ability to create a vast array of distinctive voices, animal sounds, and special effects has made him a staple in animated TV shows, films, and video games. Welker's career took off in the 60s, and he gained widespread recognition for his work on Hanna-Barbera productions. One of his most famous roles is providing the voice for Fred Jones in the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You series, along with almost every other iteration of that character. Additionally, Welker has lent his talents to other beloved characters, including Megatron in Transformers, Curious George, and Nibbler in Futurama, among countless others. Frank Welker has solidified his status as an animation voiceover legend and is also an Emmy winner. These three men stretch the definition of prolific to its limit. Miriam Flynn got her start as part of the Second City Improv Troupe in 1975. She has a huge list of credits, both as an actress and voice actress, and she's also still working today. She's best known for her roles in the vacation movies and as well as in the film Babe. April Winchell is an actress, voice actor, stand-up comic, writer, and radio host. The daughter of legendary voice actor and ventriloquist Paul Winchell, April followed her father's footsteps into the world of voice acting. Her notable voice roles include Clarabelle Cow in Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, and Mrs. Finster in Recess. Elizabeth Daly is an accomplished actress, voice actress, and singer. Early in her career, she gained prominence for her role as Dottie in the iconic film Pee-wee's Big Adventure from 1985. 
Elizabeth has lent her distinctive voice to a multitude of animated characters, most notably as the voice of Tommy Pickles in the widely popular animated TV series Rugrats and its spinoff film. She's also been in the Powerpuff Girls and the Land Before Time series. She also has a successful music career. She achieved recognition for her contributions to the soundtrack of the film The Breakfast Club and garnered further attention with her own musical releases. If you really want to watch a werewolf movie, but you're also keeping an eye on younger kids, then this is the movie for you. Otherwise, this is going to depend entirely on how much you're into the chipmunks. I was a big fan of the original chipmunks as a kid. I'll talk more about that later when I get into the history of the chipmunks. If you're a chipmunk fan, you'll love it. If you're not, it's inoffensive and bland. It's fine. This is a sequel to Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet Frankenstein. Originally, plans were in motion for a film titled Alvin and the Chipmunks Meet Dracula to make the pair into a trilogy. Unfortunately, a dispute between Ross, Bagdasarian Jr., and Universal, stemming from missing royalties, led to the cancellation of the movie, and it never came to fruition. I hope in that movie, Simon would have been turned into a vampire to round out the trio. Moving on to the synopsis. The Wolfman chases Alvin in a nightmare. Simon and Dave conclude Alvin watches too many horror films. Alvin believes that it's because their new neighbor, Larry Talbot, creeps him out and speculates that the man is hiding something. The Chipmunks and the Chipettes rehearse the school play, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. A kid named Nathan bullies Theodore. The principal knows, but says she can't do anything until Theodore asks for help. Wait, what? That, I don't think that's how that works. All six Chipmunks get spooked by something while walking home. Mr. Talbot complains the Chipmunks destroyed a rare plant specimen while running across his yard. Talbot rocks an awesome wolf's head cane that looks silver. TV psychic Madame Rhea sells a monster identification book. Obviously, Alvin orders it. Simon reminds Alvin of the hundreds of innocent people he has accused of being a monster before. Dave makes a parental decision to cut Alvin off from his monster movies, Cold Turkey. Dave confiscates all Alvin's monster paraphernalia. Alvin is cut from the role of Mr. Hyde in the play. The principal gives the role to Theodore in an effort to boost his self-esteem. Alvin convinces Simon to help him search for proof that Talbot is a werewolf. Since this is a chipmunk show, they search via a musical montage number. Dave gives Theodore some great acting advice. After giving a necklace to Eleanor, whom he has a crush on, Theodore is bitten by a werewolf, though he thinks it was just a large dog. Next morning, Theodore wants steak for breakfast. He's super fast. At rehearsal, Theodore gives an inspired performance as Mr. Hyde. His personality continues to drastically change throughout the day. At night, Theodore transforms into a puppy-like werewolf. Alvin and Simon search for a way to help Theodore with his new condition. At first, being a werewolf is good for Theodore. He's more confident, more physically coordinated, and less afraid. But he then becomes mean and aggressive. Alvin and Simon seek advice from Madame Rhea. She says Theodore is closer to the animal state and will fully turn into a werewolf soon. Simon and Alvin ask her if there's a way to cure him. After proposing they shoot their brother with a silver bullet, which the brothers correctly dismiss, she suggests knocking him out with something silver before the next full moon when the transformation will be complete. That might work. Simon tries to bring the powers of science to bear on the problem. Alvin instead steals Talbot's silver cane and tries and fails to KO Theodore. Theodore breaks the cane in two in retaliation. Theodore is also not cured, and David finds the cane pieces. Dave goes to apologize to Talbot and explain the situation to him. Talbot mentions his ancestor was killed by a silver bullet. The full moon rises and Talbot transforms into a werewolf. Dave runs to warn the boys who are performing in the play's opening night at school. However, he gets knocked unconscious by a pole. Talbot follows Dave and makes his way inside the school. He chases Alvin, who realizes that he was right to suspect Mr. Talbot. He now has proof. During the play, Theodore turns into a werewolf. The entire play is thrown into chaos. Theodore attacks Eleanor. After cornering her, the necklace Theodore gave her earlier shines in the moonlight, causing him to remember his feelings toward her and flee. Eleanor follows him, determined to help him. She's threatened by Talbot. Theodore defends her and attacks Talbot. The two battle. Theodore bites Talbot on the hand. As a result of this bite, Theodore turns back into a chipmunk and Talbot returns to human form. Talbot runs off stage. Simon explains how the bite cured them by causing the effect to reverse on them both. Alvin quickly runs on stage to receive applause from the crowd, who believe that this entire incident was just an act. 
A wrap party, the crew find out Mr. Talbot is going to be their new principal as Mrs. Milliken is taking a less challenging job driving trucks filled with nitroglycerin across rickety bridges in South America. Having finally awoken, Dave appears as Talbot gives a speech about his new position. Dave nearly attacks Talbot and starts to claim Talbot is a werewolf. The boy is quickly explained that Theodore took care of everything, leaving Dave impressed and proud of him. As Dave hugs Theodore, Mr. Talbot whispers, thank you. The chipmunks and chipettes end the rap party by doing their famous performances, and soon everyone else follows the rhythm as the movie ends. Moving on to the transformation, animation will always have an advantage when it comes to transformations and makeup jobs. Rather than being limited by silly things like practical technology and limited budgets, the artist can just draw whatever they imagine. All the werewolf looks are great. I particularly like Theodore's cub look, even if I found Talbot's look pretty basic. Unsurprisingly, this is a straight lift of the universal werewolf lore with one very odd addition. Theodore biting the werewolf that infects him undid both of their curses. This makes no logical sense. None. But this is a kid's movie. A happy ending is a requirement. In my head, I prefer the idea that Theodore being half wolf, half chipmunk is the real reason his bite had the observed effect on Larry Talbot. He was a chip wolf, not a werewolf. Alvin and the Chipmunks is a beloved and iconic franchise originating with the creation of three anthropomorphic chipmunk characters, Alvin, Simon, and Theodore. The brainchild of musician and actor Ross Bagdasarian Sr., who used the stage name David Seville, these high-pitched chipmunks made their debut in 1958 with the novelty record, The Chipmunk Song, Christmas Don't Be Late. The single became a massive hit, earning Bagdasarian three Grammy Awards, and it laid the foundation for the chipmunks' enduring popularity. Alvin quickly became the frontman with his mischievous personality. Following the success of the record, Bagdasarian created an animated television show series titled The Alvin Show, which premiered in 1961. The show featured the misadventures of the chipmunks and their interactions with their manager and adoptive father, David Seville. It ran for three seasons. It introduced the chipmunks to a wider audience through their comedic antics and musical performances. The character's popularity continued to increase. After Bagdasarian died in 1972, his son Ross Bagdasarian Jr. took over the franchise. He continued to produce albums and specials, keeping the chipmunks alive. This is where I first encountered the chipmunks. My dad and his brothers had records of the early songs. Me and my brothers listened to them a lot at Grandma and Grandpa's house. In the 1980s, a new animated series titled Alvin and the Chipmunks revitalized the franchise. This series updated the characters for a new generation and introduced the chipettes, Brittany, Jeanette, and Eleanor. It continued the tradition of incorporating humor and music into the Chipmunks' adventures. This success of the animated series led to various spin-offs, feature films, and the resurgence of Chipmunk music in different forms. The 2007 live-action CGI animated film Alvin and the Chipmunks brought the characters to another new audience. The film was a box office success and led to several sequels, creating a modern cinematic presence for the Chipmunks. Despite some controversies and disputes over royalties between Ross Bagdasarian Jr. and Universal, the legacy of Alvin and the Chipmunks endures, spanning forms of media and maintaining its status as a cherished part of popular culture. The distinctive voices of the Chipmunks were achieved through a recording technique involving audio tape manipulation. The process involved recording voices at half the normal tape speed. This slow recording pace resulted in voices sounding lower in pitch and at half the normal tempo. Upon playback at regular speed, the voices were transformed into a full octave higher in pitch, maintaining the original tempo. While this technique became synonymous with the chipmunks, it was not a novel concept, as similar methods were employed in classic films like The Wizard of Oz to create high and low-pitched character voices. Additionally, iconic voice characterizations such as Mel Blanc's Daffy Duck involved speeding up vocal recordings, predating contemporary digital pitch shifting methods used today. It's not an accident that the play the kids are performing is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We've talked about this as far back as Werewolf of London. It's a perfect metaphor for the dual nature of Theodore as he expresses his lycanthropic curse. I want to finish up by talking about the bullying subplot. Like other sensitive topics I've touched on, I'm not an expert here. I'll do my best to be sensitive. Bullying is a social issue, with consequences extending far beyond any specific incidents. The act of bullying involves the repetitive use of power or aggression to intimidate, harm, or coerce others, and it can manifest in various forms, including physical, verbal, social, and cyberbullying. 
The impact on victims can be profound, leading to emotional distress, anxiety, depression, and even long-term psychological trauma. Beyond the consequences to the bullied individual, bullying creates a toxic environment, eroding trust, stifling creativity, and undermining the collective well-being of communities, schools, and workplaces. On this front, the film does a decent job of reflecting bullying. Nathan focuses on intimidating and threatening Theodore. He does it not just to get Theodore's lunches, but mostly just because he enjoys it. We don't learn what it is in Nathan's life that has him feeling the need to dominate someone smaller and weaker than him, but he's clearly expressing that impulse. What I think the film handles less well is Mrs. Milliken's handling of the situation. Theodore's friends do their best to help him. They intervene when they see it going on. They let Theodore know he has friends. They help mitigate some of the darker potential consequences to Theodore. However, Mrs. Milliken just waits for Theodore to ask for help, even though we know she is aware of the problem. And I kind of get why. She wants him to stand up for himself in some small way, but she's responsible for his well-being. I expect her to be more proactive. Bullying requires a multifaceted approach involving fostering empathy, promoting open communication, and implementing effective anti-bullying policies. You have to intervene to accomplish those goals, not watch idly waiting for the victim to solve the problem themselves. Bullying is not a rite of passage or a required part of growing up, and its detrimental effects can persist long into adulthood, affecting both the victims and the perpetrators. She's not completely uninvolved. She does encourage a culture of kindness and inclusion. She takes concrete steps to help Theodore develop self-esteem, but she shows no interest in stopping the bullying or in instituting punitive measures for Nathan. So, if you like lycanthropes, like, share, and subscribe. Contribute your thoughts and additional observations in the comments below. Let me know what I missed or what you noticed. Next, I plan on discussing The Man and the Monster from 1959. Keep your eye on the moon, a silver bullet in the chamber, and we'll see you back here next episode.